Why did you leave Google? The main reason I left Google was because I was 75 mm -hmm. and I wanted to retire. I've done a very bad job of that. The precise timing of when I went, left Google was so that I could talk freely at a conference at MIT. But I left because I was, I'm old and I was finding it harder to program. I was making many more mistakes when I programmed, which is very annoying. You wanted to talk freely at a conference at MIT? Yes, at MIT, organized by MIT Tech Review. What did yeah. you want to talk about freely? AI safety. And you couldn't do that while you were at Google? Well, I could have done it while I was at Google. And Google encouraged me to stay and work on AI safety and said I could do whatever I liked on AI safety. You kind of censor yourself. If you work for a big company, you don't feel right saying things that will damage the big company. Even if you could get away with it, it just feels wrong to me. Mm. I didn't leave because I was cross with anything Google was doing. I think Google actually behaved very responsibly. When they had these big chatbots, they didn't release them, possibly because they were worried about their reputation. They had a very good reputation, and they didn't want to damage it. So it's, OpenAI didn't have a reputation, and so they could afford to take the gamble. I mean, there's also a big conversation happening around how it will cannibalize their core business in search. There is now, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the old innovator's dilemma to some degree, I guess, exactly. that they're, they're yes, contending with. I'm continually shocked by the types of individuals that listen to this conversation um, because they come up to me sometimes. So I hear from politicians, I hear from some rural people, I hear from entrepreneurs all over the world, whether they are the entrepreneurs building some of the biggest companies in the world or their you know, early stage startups. For those people that are listening to this conversation now that are in positions of power and influence, world leaders, let's say, what's your message to them? I'd say what you need is highly regulated capitalism. That's what seems to work best. And what would you say to the average person? Not Doesn't work in the industry, somewhat concerned about the future, doesn't know if they're helpless or not. What should they be doing in their own lives? My feeling is there's not much they can do. This isn't, isn't going to be decided by, just as climate change isn't going to be decided by people separating out the plastic bags from the... Um, compostables, that's not going to have much effect. It's going to be decided by whether the lobbyists for the big energy companies can be kept under control. I don't think there's much people can do to accept for, try and pressure their governments to force the big companies to work on AI safety. That they can do. You've lived a fascinating, fascinating winding life. I think one of the things most people don't know about you is that your family has a big history of being involved in tremendous things. You have a family tree, which is one of the most impressive that I've ever seen or read about. Your great, great grandfather, George Ball, founded the Boolean algebra logic, which is one of the foundational principles of modern computer science. You have uh, your great, great grandmother, Mary Everest Ball, who was a mathematician and educator who made huge leaps forward in mathematics from what I was able to ascertain. Um, I mean, I can get, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, your great, great uncle, George Everest, is what Mount Everest is named after. Is that, is that correct? I think he's my great, great, great uncle. His, his niece married George Bull. So Mary, Mary Bull was Mary Everest Bull. Um, she was the niece of Everest. And your first cousin once removed, Joan Hinton, was involved in the nu a nuclear physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project, which is the World War II development of the first nuclear bomb. Yeah, she was one of the two female physicists at Los Alamos. And then, after they dropped the bomb, she moved to China. Why? She was very cross with them dropping the bomb. And her family had a lot of links with China. Her mother was friends with Chen Mao. Hmm. Quite weird. When you look back at your life, Jeffrey, with the hindsight you have now and the retro retrospective clarity, what might you have done differently if you were advising me? I guess I have two pieces of advice. One is, if you have an intuition that people are doing things wrong and there's a better way to do things, don't give up on that intuition just because people say it's silly. Don't give up on the intuition until you've figured out why it's wrong. Figure out for yourself why that intuition isn't correct. And usually it's wrong. 
if it disagrees with everybody else, and you'll eventually figure out why it's wrong. But just occasionally, you'll have an intuition that's actually right and everybody else is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I lucked out that way. Early on, I thought neural nets are definitely the way to go to make AI. And almost everybody said that was crazy. And I stuck with it because I couldn't, it just seemed to me it was obviously right. Now, the idea that you should stick with your intuitions isn't going to work if you have bad intuitions. But if you have bad intuitions, you're never going to do anything anyway, so you might as well stick with them. <laughs> and in your own career journey, is there anything you look back on and say, with the hindsight I have now, I should have taken a different approach at that juncture? I wish I'd spent more time with my wife. Um, and with my children when they were little. I was kind of obsessed with work. Your wife passed away? Yeah. From ovarian cancer? No, or oh, that was another wife. Okay. Um, I had two wives die of cancer. Oh, really? Sorry. The first one died of ovarian cancer and the second one died of pancreatic cancer. And you wish you'd spent more time with her? With the second wife, yeah, who was a wonderful person. Why do you say that in your 70s? What is it that you've, you've figured out that I might not know yet? Oh, just because she's gone and I can't spend more time with her now. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you didn't know that at the time. At the time, you think, I mean, it was likely I would die before her just because she was a woman and I was a man. Um, I didn't, I just didn't spend enough time when I could. I, I think I, I inquire there because I think there's many of us that are so consumed with what we're doing professionally that we kind of assume all more immortality with our partners because they've always been there. So we, yeah. I mean, but I'm, she was very supportive of me spending a lot of time working. But and why do you say your children as well? What's the, what's the, well, I didn't spend enough time with them when they were little. And you regret that now? Yeah. If you, um, if you had a closing message for, for, my, for my listeners about AI and AI safety, what would that be, Jeffrey? There's still a chance that we can figure out how to develop AI that won't want to take over from us. And because there's a chance, we should put enormous resources into trying to figure that out. Because if we don't, it's going to take over. And are you hopeful? I just don't know. I'm agnostic. You must get, get, bed in, get in bed at night, and when you're thinking to yourself about probabilities of outcomes, there must be a bias in one direction. Because there certainly is for me. I mean, imagine everyone listening now has a internal prediction that they might not say out loud, but of how they think it's going to play out. I really don't know. I genuinely don't know. I think it's incredibly uncertain. When I'm feeling slightly depressed, I think people are toast. The AI is going to take over. When I'm feeling cheerful, I think, we'll figure out a way. Maybe one of the facets of being a human um, is because we've always been here, like we were saying about our loved ones and our relationships, we assume casually that we will always be here and we'll always yeah. figure everything out. But there's a beginning and an end to everything, as we saw from the dinosaurs. I mean, Yeah. And we have to face the possibility that unless we do something soon, when near the end. We have a closing tradition on this podcast where the last guest leaves a question in their diary. And the question that they've left for you is, with everything that you see ahead of us, what is the biggest threat you see to human happiness? I think the joblessness is a fairly urgent short-term threat to human happiness. I think if you make lots and lots of people unemployed, even if they get universal basic income, um, they're not going to be happy. Because they need purpose. Because they need purpose, yes. And struggle. They need to feel they're contributing something, they're useful. And do you think that outcome, that there's going to be huge job displacement, is more probable than not? Yes, I do. And what sort that of That one, I think, is definitely more probable than not. If I worked in a call center, I'd be terrified. And what's the time frame for that in terms of mass job I think it's beginning to happen already. I read an article in The Atlantic recently 
that said, it's already getting hard for university graduates to get jobs. And part of that may be that people are already using AI for the jobs they would have got. I spoke to the CEO of a major company that everyone will know of, lots of people use, and he said to me in DMs that they used to have seven, just over 7,000 employees. He said uh, by last year they were down to, I think, 5,000. He said right now they have 3,600. And he said by the end of summer, because of AI agents, they'll be down to 3,000. So, so it's happening already? Yes. He's halved his workforce because AI agents can now handle 80% of the customer service inquiries and other things. So it's, it's happening already. Yeah. So urgent action is needed. Yep. I don't know what that urgent action is. That's a tricky one because that depends very much on the political system. And political systems are all going in the wrong direction at present. I mean, what do we need to do? Save up money? Like, do we save money? Do we move to another part of the world? I don't know. What would you tell your kids to do? They said, Dad, like, there's going to be loads of just job displacement. Because I worked for Google for 10 years, they have enough money. <laughs> okay, okay, fuck. So what, they're not typical. What if they didn't have money? Trained to be a plumber. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Jeffrey, thank you so much. You're the first Nobel Prize winner that I've ever had a conversation with, I think, in my life. So that's a, a tremendous honor. And you, you, you received that award for a lifetime of exceptional work and pushing the world forward in so many profound ways that will lead to great and that have led to great advancements and things that matter so much to us. And now you've turned this season in your life to shining a light on some of your own work, but also on the, the, the broader risks of AI and how, um, and how it might impact us adversely. And there's very few people that have worked inside the, the machine of a Google or a big tech company that have contributed to the field of AI that are now at the very forefront of warning us against the very thing that they worked upon. There are actually a surprising number of us now. They're not as, uh, as public and they're actually quite hard to get to have these kinds of conversations because many of them are still in that industry. So, you know, someone who tries to contact these people often and asks, invites them to have conversations, they often are a little bit hesitant to speak openly. So they speak privately, but they're less willing to openly because maybe, maybe they still have something, at, some sort of incentives at play. I have an advantage over them, which is uh, I'm older, so I'm unemployed, so I can say what I like. Well, there you go. So thank you for doing what you do. It's a real honor. And please do continue to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. People, People think I'm joking when I say that, but I'm not. Or the plumbing fish. Yeah. yeah. And plumbers are pretty well paid.